Wellsby who came in and took his place in, in those games early on in the season um, when Coote was out injured at all. But the noticeable difference in that St. Helens side, because I, I remember the first quarter of the season looking at Saints thinking, Johnny Lomax looks a bit out of form. Theo Farge hasn't really controlled any games yet. And out wide, they weren't scoring tries. They weren't getting in in the corner all the time. And then Lachlan Coote came back in. Um, when they came out of lockdown in particular and they were just scoring tries all across the pitch again and they looked controlled on last tackles they looked like they had someone actually giving direction and and, and you know James Roby wasn't the only person leading that team anymore and so I, I don't think St Helens would have been in the grand final or won the grand final without Lachlan Coote this year um, I don't know if Wigan wouldn't have been there without Bevan French but I do know that I don't think St. Helens would have been without Lachlan Coote I think he was the best player Interesting, yeah um, I went for Carlos Tumabarbi because he was outstanding for us and very much underrated and at the time of voting I didn't want to vote for Lachlan Coote and I hadn't <laughs> properly considered Bevan French I don't think <laughs> maybe I just don't like him either but so that's why I voted for Loss but um to be yeah. honest, Carlos Tumavavi did get votes, as we mentioned, in the underrated player. And I do remember that period of the season where Hull FC were at their most inconsistent, sort of the first six weeks after, five or six weeks after lockdown, when this Hull FC team could have finished second bottom or in the playoffs. You didn't really know because they were that inconsistent. He was the only consistent player you had for that period, I thought. Yeah. And I think he really has come into his own a lot this year. Um, yeah. So um, there were seven non-shortlisted players that got votes, and Alex Wormsley was the only non-shortlisted player to get multiple votes. Um, and then moving to the top three, in third place was Paul McShane with 14% of the vote. In second place, agreeing with Mark, and 16% of the vote was Lachlan Coop. But the winner with 44% was Bevan French, which I don't think you can argue with. No, he's entertained us all, hasn't he, this year? Yeah. So that's his second major award, individual award this year, um, along with the writers, Rugby League Writers Player of the Year. So add that to your trophy cabinet, Bevan. There's no trophy, but add it to your trophy cabinet. <laughs> Add it to your CV. There you go. Definitely. I think it'll go at the top. Well, just below Wigan Player of the Year, I think. Um, but but there you go. Well done, Ben French. And now it is time for the one you've all been waiting for. The big one. The Dr. Bob Phillips Award for Listener's Listener of the Year. So previous winners of this award... Dr. Bob Phillips in 2014, 2015, Dr. Bob Phillips, 2016, the free peat for Dr. Bob Phillips, 2017, it was, surprisingly, Dr. Bob Phillips, in 2018, it was Fat Boy Rob Audish, and 2019, it was also Fat Boy Rob Audish. So can he get the second free peat? That well, is well, the question. Before we find that out, let's give a... SLP birthday shout out sponsored by Rob's Toy Shop to Fat Boy Rob Ordish who had his birthday this week. So um, very happy birthday to you, Rob. Happy birthday, Rob. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Okay, so everyone who got one vote on this one, we'll, we'll build it up in that order. So uh, Dom Hodgson and and all his Christmas lights, they should get a separate vote, surely. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Bob Phillips. Mike Webster, Neil McEwen or Neil McCown or Neil McEwen. Do you know what? His vote shouldn't count. I've remembered. Neil voted for himself again. That's the fourth what? year in a row, I think, that he's voted for himself. <laughs> no, no, no I, I like that. I, I, I fully respect that. But... He's committed to it. I think I've had a go at him every yeah, year. Yeah, no, I like that. But he's committed is he to Australian? Because <laughs> that, is, that is a very Australian thing to do. <laughs> no, he's, he's Whitneysian, isn't he? <laughs> Whitneysian. <laughs> speaking speaking of Wignesians. He's, he's full of uh, chemical, yeah. Go on. Yeah. Paul O'Brien. Uh, Sarah McKenzie, you got a vote? Oh, thanks. Um, Tim Griffiths, I also got a vote. Did you vote um, for yourselves? I this didn't vote for myself, no. <laughs> I also didn't vote for myself, and I didn't vote for Tim. 
I no, I kind of thought there was no reason to vote for any of the hosts, but I suppose, in a way, we listened to it as well. <laughs> um, Tom and Paige is a combo. And Got Brad, a vote. Yeah. yeah, Brad Dyer. So, don't know why he's... He did, didn't realise he listened. Whoever Brad... I think it's Brad Dyer, not Brad Dwyer, but okay. if it's Brad Dwyer or Brad Dyer, Dyer, whatever... Start sending fan reviews in if you if you're a listener that's deserved a vote. We want your fan reviews, mate. Let's get them in. Anyway. Okay, so in third place with sixteen percent of the vote, it is none other than Fat Boy Rob. Dun, dun, dun. Three Peters up. In second place with nineteen percent of the vote, it is the fastest finger in the East. It is Carsten Brimmer. Well done, Carsten. And speaking of East, the trophy is going to a new destination. It's on its way to East Hull with 25% well, of the vote. It is Tom Andrews. <laughs> no, he actually, lives in, he actually lives west of Hull. <laughs> right, we'll take a vote <laughs> off him. Does that, does that change the scores? No, it doesn't. With 25% of the vote, he's a clear winner, isn't he? Well done, Tom. Yeah, well, congratulations, Tom. Very deserved, to be honest. Um, if it, We're not handing out the host awards this year because everyone who's stuck with us this year it basically is our listener of the year. Um, <laughs> everyone that's stuck with us deserves a medal. Exactly, yeah. Um, but but Tom would have been looking for potentially a, a repeat on that because he's he contributes every show, he retweets everything we put out there pretty much, is, is always looking to expand the rugby league pod uh, the sorry the super league pod community um and uh and so i'm glad that the the voters out there have have recognized that by giving tom this award so that he can finally legitimately refer to himself as the double champ having won the listener of the year last year oh no joint list he was joint listener of the year wasn't he the contributor of the year last year he won um <laughs> he tried to steal any shine off of off of page to take the listener of the year for himself but this year he does get the listeners listener of the year award just for himself yeah richly deserved excellent uh well done tom and you uh headline the slp awards this year so well done for it's, being... it's nice to see it's nice to see someone connected with rovers getting some silverware that's it yeah he is the 2020 sloppy king now we are going to have a quick break and then be back with um predictions revisited okay so 2020 was a year that everyone's predictions just well were pointless but it's interesting always at the end of the year to go back and and look back at, at what we predicted and this year in a weird way it's it's even more interesting to go back and look at what we predicted um because not all of it actually turned out so so terribly wrong um and we'll start with saint saint helens being the slp voters favorites to win the grand final before the season started 42 percent of our listeners picked them including you alan and tim so um you there know you go. there you go some things in 2020 did turn out as planned or as expected <laughs> yeah i mean i think 42 percent of people will agree they were the obvious choice so um I, I don't take a massive amount of credit for picking them but <laughs> um but yeah no the um yeah it was uh it's, it's nice to be right occasionally yeah, well, one one news story that this lets us link into, I suppose, is the man who's been the assistant for both those last two grand final wins for St. Helens, Richard Marshall, has now got his chance to be a head coach at the Super League level, um, being appointed at Salford uh, as he leaves St. Helens. And also Danny Orr. Um, who knew that his mum was a big Salford fan? But Danny Orr joining, joining Richard Marshall as the assistant coach there after his time with Castleford. So... What do we make of that appointment uh, or those appointments? Uh, Sarah, I'll, st- I'll start with you. Yeah, um, I mean, I guess he's, you know, he's got experience as a second, uh, like an assistant, hasn't he? And um, I guess it's the next step up and Salford are quite keen, possibly because of finances or other reasons, but they are quite good at sort of that breaking a new coach in. Um it, it, I guess with as with any of these sort of um, 
like their first appointments it's a bit of an unknown quantity it, it's a gamble which could go horribly wrong or you know could be a great thing it's very difficult to know at this point isn't it um tough act to follow isn't it as well um at, yeah i think Solvent. especially because uh watson was you know sort of an unknown and did so well and really sort of mobilized that team and you know the sum was greater than uh, the the total was greater than the sum of the parts type thing so you wonder whether um Marshall has a little bit of pressure from that point of view as well you know he managed to do a lot with not much and therefore you should be able to as well yeah it's a little bit of squad turnover but they're working to keep hold of some players that Watson himself has kind of got an eye on to to take maybe to, to Huddersfield but they've brought in some good people as well Joe Burgess being kind of the headline uh, yeah. act of the recent signings for Salford. Marshall had a good good time in the championship, didn't he, before he had his time as the assistant at, at St. Helens, Tim. So do you think this was like kind of the natural progression, I suppose? I think so. I think it's a, it's a clear yeah, career path for him. I think it's a great opportunity. It's probably one of the more stable off-the-field uh, jobs you can get. I think they will give him time if he needs it. Um, so I think that's quite good. Obviously, it does mean that he is now leading in scariest eyes of a Super League head coach. <laughs> I mean, it's easy to forget the kind of the minor miracles that Mar- Marshall did at Halifax. You know, he he turned them into a regular kind of middle eight kind of contender when they didn't really have the budget to do it. So he, he, he did a very good job a at Halifax. Side together as well, didn't he? at Halifax when they didn't really have the budget to do it so I wonder if he'll be able to kind of inst- institute that kind of infrastructure at Salford as well well let's hope so it'd be really good wouldn't it if he could because that is one thing that I think is holding Salford's development back yeah definitely uh- I think we're all probably on the side of it it's a decent appointment and let's see if he can follow up on the promise we've seen as a championship coach and the development we've seen as a, as a second man at the, at the Super League le- level. Danny Orr coming in has got plenty of experience coaching in and around Super League and, and so that's a, a good a good mind to have alongside him, uh, Alan. Yeah, for me, as a combination, it, it, it feels quite appropriate for Salford. You know, two guys who are wanting to um, I'm sure Danny Orr will be have his eye on a um, on a head coaching job, and he probably was looking for some of these jobs, maybe um, that were available. So he'll probably see this as an opportunity to um, to, yeah, as you say, freshen up his experience in a different environment, and maybe maybe himself look at look at getting a job at uh, some point uh, fairly soon. Yeah, because it could have been limited just by being seen as sort of Daryl Powell's kind of man who brought the balls out sort of thing so this is a chance for him to show his who he is what he can do because it it was almost always like he was the guy carrying the water on and off and more focus was on obviously Powell's the head coach but also talking of crazy eyes Tim um, Sheridan as the assistant as the other assistant at, at Cass right so pretty good prediction there on the on the top of the uh, on the grand final winners but um, only 7% of voters predicted that Leeds Rhinos would win the Challenge Cup in 2020 so well done to everyone that guessed it would happen uh, Wigan who beat Leeds in the semi-finals had been the voters favourites to win it but alas it was not to be none of us four picked Leeds as cup winners are we shocked at that? <laughs> not after the way they went out the year before so <laughs> <laughs> no Actually, whilst we're on the topic of Leeds, we've had a tweet whilst we've been recording um, from second place listener of listeners, listener of the year, Carson Brummo, who's um, tapped us into what Leeds Rhinos are up to this year. So it's on topic for the award for the um, prediction we're revisiting. But Leeds have offered a free supporter membership to all Toronto Wolfpack um, season ticket holders. So, so they basically they've built a membership that's a, that is built for the Wolfpack fan base. 
Um, this kind of shows their long-term strategy. They obviously knew that all the other clubs were going to vote against them. So if it looked like they liked them, maybe they could get these fans into their club as fans. <laughs> um, it feels like that's what's happened here, doesn't it? It's, 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 it's... 